um, we've spent the last hundred years building out the entire ecosystem for internal combustion engines. Every bit and piece of that, right? Everything from repair to, to scrappage to, to towing to training, right? And tools and technologies, right? Um, but a good chunk of that's going to change here. Mm -hmm. It's an evolution right now. And one of the pieces of that is a point you're making here, which is that we're going to transition from the existing refueling infrastructure to this mass scale, ubiquitous infrastructure everywhere at people's homes. Yeah. And this is also one of the reasons that the government is looking, to, and in fact, is, is, is requiring that people who have EV chargers need to register them and report out. Because if you think ahead maybe 20 years from now or 30 years from now, that government needs information about who's charging and how often right. and how much energy is flowing through that. They collect that today because you know every time you fill up with gasoline, there's tax associated with that. There's just the volume number. Yeah, right? there they, you, they know it to the liter. Right? There, there you go. Right? That, so, that's just it, yeah. So so in the future, though, 30 years out, um, that's basically going to be going to be gone. And you're going to have literally hundreds of thousands of EV chargers who are going to be now part of that refueling uh, system. Mm -hmm. And government's going to want to look at that. And the question is, what does government do about that? Hello, EV friends, and welcome. Joining me on today's podcast is Dennis Ragoza. Dennis holds a master's degree in environmental studies and has spent the last 25 years working on low-carbon initiatives, both as a BC government regulator and as a private consultant. Dennis created the BC Scrap It program, where he spent 12 years as the CEO. The program offers incentives to people willing to scrap their older, polluting vehicles and replace them with a newer vehicle or other cleaner transportation option. The program is responsible for removing over 50,000 older, high-polluting vehicles from the roads. His latest venture has led him, led him to doing work under the new BC Carbon Offset Regulations, which will be the focus of today's podcast. Dennis, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. My pleasure to be with you today. All right. Uh, so we're here today to, uh, to talk about some uh, provincial amendments to the Carbon Offset Regulations. But before we dive into that, um, and for our audience... Uh, we're hearing so much about carbon in the news these days. We're hearing carbon tax, carbon offset, carbon credits. Uh, what is the difference between all this? Is 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 the carbon offset? Are these regulations? Is it just another form of taxation? What what is carbon offset? So I guess the first issue is how do we as a country achieve a reduction in carbon emissions? And so everybody wants to have an impact on climate change and reduce their own footprint. Mm -hmm. So there's a variety of tools available, really, personally, as well as um, in terms of the regulatory environment, say the government of Canada or the government of British Columbia. So they look at their toolkit, right? right. Inside their toolkit are these different kinds of instruments, uh, everything from sales mandates to e for EVs, for example, mm -hmm. to offering uh, a pathway for the fuel industry in the transportation sector to reduce their emissions. Okay. Because they're all trying to get to the same reduced emissions point, right? right? So things like um, offsets and carbon credits is just a piece in the toolkit. Mm -hmm. And so if you reach inside that toolkit, what you basically see is a really simple idea. And that simple idea is that if you have a, a party, let's say yourself, and you were an emitter, and government came along and said, we need you to reduce your emissions. Right. right? So, so an emitter would be Shell or Esso or... Yeah. Any yeah, of the big gas companies. Right, a big oil company, for yeah. example, that government's coming along and sort of saying, we are going to require you to reduce the emissions right, from your fuels that are sold in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? So they can put more ethanol, lower carbon fuels mm -hmm. into the fuel system, like ethanol or biodiesel are two examples. Right. right? Um, and Or reduce their own emissions upstream at the refinery. But the third way, uh, this is where carbon credits come in, is that government allows a party like someone who owns an EV charger mm -hmm. to create credits and sell those credits to the uh, oil company and the oil company meets its regulate, regulated uh, mandates, right? Mm -hmm. If they don't, they're penalized. So it's a bit of a carrot, chicken, egg here for the oil companies to meet lower carbon emissions. Right. And, and uh, one way to do that is to acquire 
offset credits from a different party who is reducing emissions already. Right. So that kind of it's the whole balance question. So I, I'm producing excess emissions. I'm going to buy these credits and I'm going to apply them to solar or wind or electric vehicles, for instance. Yeah. So um, it's normally the situation that there's kind of a, a closed system. Like in British Columbia, we have a low carbon fuel regulation here. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a closed system. Only parties such as, as oil companies can participate in that um, and buy and sell credits. And other parties, for example, like uh, EV charger owners, can also participate in that, right? But but no one else outside that system could really participate. So you can swap credits and sell credits within that system in order to meet a declining carbon emissions for the fuels. Okay. So it's that's how EV credits offset the emissions to allow the oil companies Got to it. meet their required mandates because if they don't do that, they're penalized. Right. So we're not talking, this is a, another form of taxation. No, not really. No. Now, there is a question about uh, how do the companies achieve their mandates and what are the costs associated with that and who pays those costs, right? Right. So to get to low carbon fuels is not necessarily free because some of these mm -hmm. fuels cost a little bit more money or buying credits from an EV charger owner, for example, also costs money. So right. what, what does the market do with that? What, what do the big oil companies do with that? And I think I think it's fair to say that there is a slight bump in, in prices at the pump. Right. Right. But the 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 um, the offset to that is lower emissions. So, right. so if, this is a challenge for the public, right? Uh -huh. it, it, if you want to get to a, a a reduced carbon footprint, how do you do that, and how do you pay for it? Right. right. Nothing is free. Uh, right. Definitely not. Uh, definitely not uh, energy. So in BC now. Um, we haven't heard much of this in the news. Um, I don't think the average EV owner knows about this, let alone the industry that it's going to impact. Uh, but I believe it was last year, um, the provincial government has changed the carbon offset regulations, which have been around, my understanding, for a long time. Yeah. Um, could you briefly explain what are those regulations? What do they mean? And then we'll talk, what is that going to mean for the automotive industry? Yeah, so... Um, up to the beginning of 2022, um, if you owned um, an EV charger and mm -hmm. and you were not able to claim credits for that and sell them in the market, not like your own home charger, right? Any, yeah. So so what the government did is, is implemented new regulations that said uh, anybody who actually owns a charger and pays the electrical bill mm -hmm. in BC, if it's in a facility that's got five or more uh, uh, residential units or a commercial building or let's say this building we're in, right? Right. Uh, you can actually then uh, register your charger. You then report out the annual kilowatt hours coming from that charger. Those then go into your account and then you you create credits for that. The government actually creates the credits for you in their calculation. Right. So just to be clear, this is not uh, the homeowner with a garage and he's put in a level two. He, no. He's not participating in right. this. But but if it's five or more, like a condo complex or an apartment complex, right. um, they can. So previously, it was BC Hydro that was claiming all right. of the credit. Exactly. And they still do claim the credits if it's four or fewer units, right? Right, on that single. But now an individual business can now claim those those credits. Exactly. Any kind of uh, business situation, I think about the shopping malls or garages or, or the, the building we're in right now, any kind of commercial uh, situation where you have a charger, um, you can you can claim those credits. But in order to claim them, you have to first of all register your charger and it has to be accepted by government. And then you have to report out each year okay. what the kilowatt hours are that flow through the charger. So let's talk about that in a bit. Let's just get back to the question of why. Uh, what's the why is government doing this? Uh, wh uh, why did it transfer uh, BC Hydro from getting those credits onto individual business owners or to strata complexes? What's what's the purpose or what's driving this? Well, I I think I mean I can't speak for government on this, but I think it it had to do with the issue of fairness. Because for example, take a, a large strata yeah. um, where they might have two hundred. Uh, parking stalls, and they've decided to uh, establish 200 chargers in there. So they've taken their financial resources from that strata and all its okay. members. They made the big investments in that, and they also paid the electrical bill for that. 
So they have incurred all the investments and operating costs associated mm-hmm. with that. So government basically said, if you're doing that because you're making the investment and you're right. paying the bill, you should now be able to monetize the credit side of that because you've done the right thing. So it's really at the heart of it. This is a charging incentive program. Well, it, it could be described as that, okay. uh, that because what you could do, obviously, is once you've um, been able to claim your credits and sell them, uh, you can take those funds to uh, subsidize the operating costs of the chargers, for example, or or right. pr- or pay down the cost of building the ch- and put installing the chargers. Right. Okay. Which that explanation would make sense. Um, I think all of the EV growth, in in my opinion, hinges on two things. One is the battery. Two is the charging infrastructure. But it's even less than the battery. No one before with uh, with internal combustion engines ever questioned the size of a gas tank. When you right. purchase a new car, you you know what what what's my range in this that was never an issue and the reason was simply is because you knew there was an infrastructure built a filling stations just down the road you right. could time uh, you could time this now this is just less so and one of the reasons in the push for bigger batteries is because we don't have that charging infrastructure if chargers were just ubiquitous you wouldn't have to worry as much about getting the biggest and and, and longest range battery really yeah. Um, so it's really the chicken and the egg. The charging infrastructure has to come first and foremost. I would agree that that there is a gap in Canada today with respect to the amount of infrastructure that's out there. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, all the studies I've seen on this issue said that probably 70% of the people are going to charge their vehicle at home, or whatever the home is. It could be a strata, a condo. Right. It could be maybe you drive to this building and you charge up here, like it, whatever, as opposed to what they call public charging, mm-hmm. uh, which is a right. standalone DC fast charger situation. So the issue then is how many chargers are out there relative to how many EVs are out there and mm-hmm. is there a gap, right? So I think that uh, as the number of EVs that come on the road is going to increase substantially, whether it's mandates or consumer preference, uh, there's going to be more charging coming. Um, the challenge really is on the public charging side, I would say, that that uh, the, to put a, a standalone public charging thing is expensive. Right. Because often it's DC fast charging, costs fifty to $100,000 a charger to put this in. And you also happen to pay uh, demand charges for the electrical utility, which is expensive. So it's a very high cost alternative. So we need a lot more about home or commercial charging out there, workplace charging, than we have today. And it has to increase by tens of thousands of chargers to, to match the growth in the number of EV go, EVs on the road. Mm-hmm. And there's a gap in that today. No question about that. Yeah. So you can see. So if there's an incentive for any public or commercial building to start setting up chargers, um, obviously it's just going to increase the amount of chargers that are available chargers that are out there which is the biggest question right um and it can also be somewhat uh, i guess of a, of a revenue source i mean in some ways it's maybe like the d- democratization of the transportation refueling infrastructure um it's no longer just the purvy of large oil companies but it's it's anyone with a charger right um i mean i i've seen advertisements for a, a type of an airbnb but for charging like if okay. you had a home in a garage, you could actually advertise that out. I don't know how that would work, right. um, but that's an interesting concept. Yeah, you raise a really interesting point because um, we've spent the last hundred years building out the entire ecosystem for internal combustion engines. Every bit and piece of that, right? Everything from repair to to scrappage to to towing to training, right? And tools and technologies, right? Um, but a good chunk of that's going to change here. Mm-hmm. It's in evolution right now. And one of the pieces of that is a point you're making here, which is that we're going to transition from the existing refueling infrastructure to this mass scale, ubiquitous infrastructure everywhere at people's homes. Yeah. And this is also one of the reasons that the government is looking to, and in fact, is, is, is requiring that people who have EV chargers need to register them and report out. Because if you think ahead maybe 20 years from now or 30 years from now, that government needs information about who's charging and how often, right. and how much energy is flowing through that. They collect that today because 
you know, every time you fill up with gasoline, there's a tax associated with that. There's the volume number. Yeah, right? they, you, they know it to the liter, right? There, there you go. Right? That, so, that's just it, yeah. <laughs> so, so in the future, though, 30 years out, um, that's basically going to be going to be gone, and you're going to have literally hundreds of thousands of EV chargers who are going to be now part of that refueling uh, system, mm-hmm. and government's going to want to look at that. And the question is, what does government do about that, right? And will there be a and will will the current gas taxes then have to shift to 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 that? Right, that's a whole different the, question, right? And then right. no one. Some U.S. states have addressed that already with EVs, but they charge yeah. you a, a, an additional annual registration fee. Mm-hmm. It's really a, a called a highway tax. Really, EVs uh, historically uh, vehicles pay a, a fuel tax, on which a good portion of that goes to fund the highways, right, mm-hmm. directly or indirectly. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, I think Washington State, Illinois, places like that, have imposed one, two, three hundred dollars a year uh, a fee, really to help that EV pay for its highway usage, right? Mm-hmm. So. Uh, that's a that's a future question, I think, in yeah. all the jurisdictions, right? Is Absolutely. that if if all the revenue goes to zero because you don't collect a gas tax anymore, how do you now collect a one to two billion dollars a year to pay for the highways, right? Yeah, there there's nothing's for free, and there's nothing a, a free ride. I guess the idea is that eventually the technology is such that it's a net benefit right. uh, to 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 what you have to pay. Now, bring it back just to the automotive industry in general. Um, I've heard talk of, uh, say, dealerships, for instance, installing five or t- ten of these um, uh, to actually bring people into their facility. Um, are we seeing any of that, or have you heard of any interest in that, or is that even feasible? Yeah, I think that uh, as part of this shift to a, um, to the majority of EVs being sold and on the road, right, um, then if you look at that kind of... Uh, 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 I'll call it ecosystem here, starting with a new car dealer, for example. Mm-hmm. And because the vehicles they sell are going to need to be refueled. Like, like how do they refuel them? Uh, they That's need right. to have charging on site. And as more and more of them are, are mm-hmm. uh, EVs and need more refueling infrastructure. Um, but also um, what's happening is that they offer a, a way for a, one of their customers to come back in and they might have a faster charger because maybe the customer doesn't have charging, right? That's right. So uh, it's an enhanced relationship between a dealership and that customer. Mm-hmm. And that's been, I think you see more and more of that now in the new car dealer side. Yeah. Uh, on, on the used car dealer side, I think that's still coming, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I just noticed now an article that appeared in the last day or so that um, the number of used uh, EVs being sold in the U.S. has dramatically increased. Mm-hmm. Because if you think about the number of uh, vehicles, like especially the Tesla environment, right? The used car, the used Tesla market in places like LA, where Tesla's been out in the world, yeah. is quite significant, right? Yeah. So, so many of those vehicles now are, are almost out of warranty. They're now in the used car mm-hmm. market. Uh, they're now being sold uh, in the usual ways vehicles are being sold, either through used car dealerships or privately, right? So, uh, on the used car dealership side, they're going to need to, I mean, my view is that as part of the customer. So first of all, they have to refuel the vehicles they have in a lot because they can't go to the... <laughs> to yeah, in, in the U.S., there's some big used car dealerships where exactly. there's hundreds and hundreds of cars. Exactly. So um, if you've got a, a hundred EVs on your lot and people want to take them for test drives, uh, you have to make sure they're fueled up for that purpose, right? You can't yeah. let people stranded out there somewhere, right? Right. So I think that as part of the customer service is all maintaining your own fleet. Um and that you can actually generate credits. For example, if a used car dealership decided to do this here in BC, uh, they had a couple of charges, they can generate their own credits off that. So they, they, refuel, right. their, they refuel their vehicles, they offer that to the customers, they maybe the customer might come back and, and refuel there once a month or whatever they want to do, right? Right. So it's, well, it, 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 and not just for dealership, I mean, it's going to start making sense for uh, all the other uh, automotive service businesses, whether you're a repair, right. collision repair, or especially a, a towing facility. Yes. Uh, I mean, the number of, say, impounded vehicles that they, they get in are going to need to be maintained. They're charged. Sometimes they're up there in impounded for up to a period of 60 days. Yes. Um, but then their own fleets, because as BC has been moving forward with the light duty uh, EV mandates, they are now starting it on the commercial end. Exactly. How that's going to work for the heavy duty tow trucks, we don't know yet, but um, certainly they can start seeing their fleet being electrified within the next 20 years. Precisely. Uh, and it makes sense that they're going to have their own char- 
uh, internal charging infrastructure. Exactly. So all these benefits, uh, so all these business uh, businesses can now start to benefit through these regulations. But you mentioned this reporting. Right. Whenever you get into reporting uh, as a business owner, uh, I don't know. That smacks of a lot of regulation and red tape. And how do we get around that? Right. So uh, what I've been doing for the last year is working uh, with a company um, headquartered in Richmond called Four Season Technologies, and and they are what are called a credit uh, reporting and aggregation company, okay. and they work with customers, uh, all their customers, because they sell a lot of EV charges themselves, but anybody else out there, like Stratus, for example, yeah. and um, and they provide a turnkey service, so they make all the complexities of government go away. And, and lead people through the entire process uh, by the hand, if you will, and eliminate a lot of complexities. Uh, because, of, in fact, I, you know, if, an, if I'll call it the average person, uh, whoever they might be, goes to the government website and looks at the website and starts trying to digest all the material inside of that, like it's quite an effort, right? Right. Um, for people who are familiar with it, it's understandable. Even the language being used is semi-legal. So a lot of the terms in there are a little uncertain and unclear. Right. Um, they might be certain in the legal world and the regulated world. I've been a former regulator myself, so I understand it all. But I think for the average person, it's harder to do that. And for them to try and go through that process, that's a that's a challenge, it, no question, right? Yeah, especially for the for 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 smaller players and for the smaller shops. Um, um, I mean, they're busy. Uh, repairing and service cars, they don't have time to do this. Right. So, so let's say a repair shop has installed a, a level two charger, yeah. uh, or even a, if it's a DC fast charge. Although I don't think there's many of those around the individual businesses, but probably will be uh, eventually. Um, they even if they just have that one level two, they are currently under law supposed to be reporting. Right. right? Okay. So, what can they? What can they do? Uh, do they approach Four Season? Four yep. Season reports on their behalf. Do they have to pay a fee to Four Season? How does this work? So the, the idea is that you could just go to the website and register. Called it's like greencredits.fourseason.com. Okay. And just go through a simple, straightforward process, you know, and 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 there's it, it plain language explanations and everything else, and you okay. sign up. And there's a it's a fee structure. There's costs associated with doing this, and so it's a basically a revenue share, a modest revenue share. So so most of the funds uh, you know flow back to the provider of the credit. In which case, let's say it's a, a repair shop or or a towing company or whatever. So okay. but they have to go through this process, you know, and we right. take them through the process to do that. And uh, I, I would say the the first time through is a little bit harder, right? Right. But but year one's the, t the harder one. Mm -hmm. uh, year two is easier easier. And you do raise a good point that uh, what government, I mentioned earlier, government trying to do is trying to find out where all these charges are in the kilowatt mm -hmm. hours. So the law actually does say that if you have a charge, you actually need, legally need to register it and report. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to date, government has not have, had a heavy hand on that. Right. right? Because they, they've allowed everybody to work away at this a bit, right? But I think they're getting a little more anxious yeah. about that. They haven't even right. built the awareness. I, I mean, uh, there's been no outreach to the associations right. or to the industry as well. I mean, I, I was alerted to this by you, actually, right. and, and I was surprised to learn it. the uh, amendments were last year. You, you were on top of this right. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So government's um, challenged, I think. Uh, you know, regulators always are challenged to communicate. Right. Especially when you think about all the parties they have to communicate here, too. Right. Right. And so um, ARA is one of dozens of organizations alone, never mind their thousands of members, all right. have to get the message and do something, right? So that's harder. Right. So if I have a level two charger, uh, I've gone through the paperwork, um, I can actually expect back a residual check? Yes. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. It takes a little time because you have to, and yeah. so just the timing of this is that the law says that, let's say for 2023, uh, that you, uh, if you had a charge, you need to formally report out, register and report it out before the end of March, mm -hmm. so uh, of 2024. So every year, it's the end of March, the year following, right? So, um, so people, if they want to be in compliance, and I know there's a lot of organizations aren't aware of this, but their their core company philosophy uh, is to always stay in compliance with the law, right? Right. And, you know, the old thing about it is ignorance of the law doesn't mean you're, can't, can't, mm -hmm. you can ignore it and you can't comply and you shouldn't comply with it. 
So you especially see this issue in bigger companies, right? Like large companies who have big compliance departments, right? Certainly. So, yeah. uh, but this is true of medium sized and small companies as well. They're staying in compliance because at some point the rubber is going to hit the road on this, right? Where government's going to come along and sort of say, okay, you now need to comply. You haven't complied. We're now going to apply it at a, I'll use the word they right. use, like administrative penalty, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, against you for not complying. So I think we're in this soft period right now. And uh, I would agree, I think government can do a better job in communicating to organizations like ARA and many others out there as well. And I, in my conversation with them, I told them that, right? Said, just get going and do this, right? Yeah. Because um, if you don't do it, this can take a long time to get compliance, right? Mm-hmm. Because people don't know about it. Well, well that's right. And, and maybe they only hear the one side. They hear the reporting side, the compliance part. They're not hearing. It's a bit of a carrot and stick, right? right. But the carrot, I can actually collect a residual check. Exactly. Now, is that just based on your own personal consumption? Because you mentioned you aggregate everything together. Uh, is this putting it all into one pool and dividing it up equally, or is your residual based on only the amount of electricity that you so are actually using? What happens is that um, if you have one charger, and depending on the kilowatt hours generated, but uh, give or take, it's about eleven hundred kilowatt hours per year equals mm-hmm. one credit. Give or take a few kilowatt right, hours. Okay. Right. So let's assume you have two credits, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, the reality uh, is that. Uh, no one's going to buy two credits because the the cost of doing that, the legal cost, the agreements, and everything else associated with that is too too pro- pro- prohibitive. And on the buyer side, you think there's only about maybe ten buyers. And so, if you're a, a Shell or Imperial Oil or something like that, um, you, you are not going to sign five thousand legal agreements, right, with with pe- people who have two credits each. Right, you simply. Your legal department will reject all that, right? Oh, sure. It's not going to happen. Yeah. So therefore, what we do is we aggregate those two credits at a time from all these different parties and bundle it together, okay. and then we sell it. So uh, we have arrangements we have uh, and with Four Seasons, and I'm their strategic advisor on this, that already, it's all already pre-sold, right? Like we, we have the buyer lined up. We just sign a little agreement. It's gone, right? Right. So we set all that infrastructure up for them, right? Um so that's where the aggregation comes in. We take the, the onesies and twosies, put them in a bigger pool, easier to sell. Because there's no market for onesies and twosie credits, right? Right, right. But, just but, no but a thousand, you, you can line up a buyer, you can sell, and then right. and then you take that and then you divide it up based on exactly. your basically your, your energy consumption. Right. The pro rate amount. The exactly, pro rate right? amount. You know, because if I had two charges and you had two charges and I did 10 credits and you did two credits, then I would get the prorated amount of the total amount of proceeds, right? Right. Based on 10 versus two credits. So, yeah. Well, it sounds like a win-win. I, I mean, hey, I don't have any of the hassle of reporting. I'm in full compliance, plus I get a check. Exactly. Um, that's probably going to be an incentive for me to install a charger. Right. But there's also, uh, and it was announced yesterday, if you want to touch on, yeah. um, some added incentives for installing an EV charging. Yeah, the BC government yesterday announced two things, uh, two major things. One is uh, uh, an uh, amendment to their uh, new car sales mandate for EVs, and they're going to be more aggressive in that. And we can talk about that in a second. And then secondly is they're reinstituting up the incentive program for EV charging. So for whether you have a home or a business or whatever, Mm -hmm. uh, you can you'll be eligible. I think by the end of of October. Uh, to receive additional funding really out of the program, which is okay. a good thing, right? To, yeah. to help people uh, defer those costs up front. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, they're, they're, they're doing a lot of positive things anyways, at least in, in BC. Uh, again, getting back to my original point, it's, it's so much more about the charging infrastructure than it is the size of the battery. We actually have to get away from yeah. that. That's going to be counterproductive to the environmental aims if these batteries should have to bigger and bigger and i think they've they've really actually gotten as big as they yeah. possibly we can um so, so just w- if i could just comment yes. on that because i think that you've raised a really extremely important point and that is there's a, a circularity here and the circularity mm-hmm. is that if you have extensive massive uh, charging infrastructure and you as a, a driver don't have to worry about range anymore because you can charge up anywhere and yeah. do so pretty quickly then that means you can have a vehicle that's got a smaller battery. And this reduces the first cost of the EV. So if you look at the at the price of a conventional uh, internal combustion engine today uh, vehicle, let's say a Honda Civic as an mm-hmm. example. So you could probably buy a pretty well-equipped Honda Civic for maybe, uh, I'll throw out 30000 probably in that, in that order anyways, right? 
Uh, but if you look at the EV world, uh, Black Black Book announced, uh, I think, a few days ago that the average cost of an EV in Canada was seventy five thousand dollars this mm-hmm. past year. Now, of course, there's a lot of high end vehicles in that in that average. But still, you can see there's a big gap here between the first cost today of a of a really nicely equipped EV, uh, it's a non-EV internal combustion engine vehicle versus the low-end EV cost, right? So if you yeah. can bring that EV cost even further down, maybe with new battery technology, perhaps a reduction in the size of the battery, and now it's getting close to the cost of an internal combustion engine, you're going to have mass consumer uptake, I think, in those kinds of vehicles. Otherwise, it's going to be a big challenge. And, yeah. you know, this is what some of the feedback has been, you know, on the minister announcement it, yesterday. It's also going to sustain the life of that vehicle out for as long as possible. Uh, prematurely ending a life of an electric vehicle is counter to its environmental aims. Um, the, the biggest difference between a uh, purchase of a used ICE vehicle and a used EV is it's in its functionality. When you buy a used um, gasoline-powered uh, yeah, okay, it it's, doesn't look as pretty, it's marked up, the interior is scuffed up, all that sort of stuff. You're not losing any of the functionality of it. With an EV, it's different because of the battery degradation. Now, if you're faced, you've got this 10-year-old vehicle and its battery has degraded down to 80%, it still technically still has a lot of life in it. But because of that reduced range, if you do not have the chargers in place, uh, again, um, that reduced range is really going to bring down that value of the vehicle. Yeah, no, oh, that's an excellent point. Is because um, if you, um, I used to be the CEO of the scrapbook program. We'd looked at a lot of old vehicles. And how old are they? I mean, we'd get in vehicles like 30, 40 years old in for mm-hmm. scrapage, right? Yeah. So is an EV going to last for forty years on the road with the with the original battery in it? So, or are Good we going to be in an interesting future scenario? Yeah. Where in fact the used vehicle markets can be quite different because the longevity in EV is now determined by the battery and the replacement cost of the battery. Right. And it's far more, right, than the cost of the internal combustion engine at the same age. So we could have a situation where um, used EVs will have a value until they don't. Right, exactly, and and sustaining the life of that a is going to build an inclusion uh, into this whole thing, um, because if you take a big market segment and alienate them, right, they're really they're going to care less, obviously, about the environment, right? It can't be the purview of those who can afford it, and that's a very important point that I, I think everyone's really kind of grappling with, and we don't quite know what the future is. It's um, a- yeah. Sorry. It's an unknown issue it's, because we haven't had enough EVs on the road long enough yet to see how that's going to actually transpire in the market. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so just uh, for a sort of a final thought, we ask all our guests this, uh, where do you see us in terms of the, in, the whole EV charging infrastructure in five to 10 years? What does that fit? What is that future going to look like? Do you think optimistic or pessimistic? I'm very optimistic in that way because I think that there's the, if you look at all the surveys that have been done about uh, when people are posed the question, would you buy, buy an EV as your next vehicle? Mm-hmm. And like 80% say yes, right? Roughly, right? <clears throat> so then the issue is how does that translate? And and is it translate into buying a, U, a new or used EV? And what do you do about the st- uh, the uh, recharging capacity on that? And what do you do about the uh, EV charging on that? So I think that that's going to drive a lot of charging infrastructure, right? Uh, I already see a l- huge interest, that, for example, in the strata community, right? There's many, many right. stratas. One of, and there's a lot of stratas in British Columbia, I think like 25,000 or so. But if you take the top 10,000, which are big stratas, they all are very, very keenly interested in installing charging. Because they can see that's the future, right? And right. They, and and the same is true on the I'll call it the townhome area as well as individual home area, where people are now going to if they have an EV, if they buy an EV, they're highly likely going to install home charging. It's it's going to be a, again, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing because I've heard the counter to that. You have a Strata and ten um, percent uh, own EVs. Uh, and they want a charging infrastructure. And the 90% are saying, why should we pay more so that you can have your own personal charger? Right. Um, however, there, there's going to be some sort of a tipping point as more and more people, they actually have to buy the EVs 
that increase the percentage, and then they become the majority vote. Right. Yeah, I think the uh, the future is a bit like Rubik's cube. It's going to twist and turn, right? As mm-hmm. as you go ahead on these issues, I mean, I mean some some strategies in, in your situation, as you described, likely will proceed. Uh, some won't mm-hmm. until there's more and more demand for it. Uh, I mean, I've heard a theme uh, uh, a number of times, right? Which basically says, uh, in a strata situation, if you in fact have EV charging in that, that increases the value of your property. Because that allows right. you to that it, it makes your your condo more attractive in the market, because you're now offering something that no one else is doing, and that's if you have an EV, you can actually charge it. Mm-hmm. And as more and more EV come on the road um, and being parked in the, in the you know in the parkades of Stratus, that's going to become more and more important. So I think that this thing will kind of move ahead in a in a, in a kind of a waddling way. And, and it'll depend on each strata and, and those fundamentals. Yeah. But I'm yeah. very optimistic about that. I, I think that, yeah, we're, 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 you know, if we step back from EVs for a second and sort of say, globally, what do we need to do here, right. really, for, for climate change? And the, the answer really is we need to electrify. Mm-hmm. So we're probably in a 100-year mission here to, to change our economy into a, a, almost a pure electric economy. It may not be possible for all sectors, exactly. like maybe airplanes, for example, can't do that. But, yeah. but, but many other sectors will be able to do that. So this is going to take a little time. Just like, like if you think about the infrastructure for uh, internal combustion engines, this didn't happen overnight. There wasn't Absolutely. a gas station in every corner, right? Yeah. This took a long time to put all that infrastructure in place. Yeah. But fundamentally, if we're going to quieten carbon down and achieve carbon objectives globally, we have to go to an electrified world. Yeah, I uh, absolutely agree with you. So uh, for our audience uh, and for our industry audience members uh, who have just installed a level two charger, this is all news to them. Um, Tell me just about Four Season, where you're located and how they can contact yourself or the website. And we'll, we'll post the website up uh, on this uh, in the, uh, description and uh, on this video. Yeah, Four Season Technology is uh, headquartered in uh, Richmond, okay. a pretty large company, uh, 100 employees, and uh, they're the, a very large distributor and seller of EV chargers, um, but also offering this this credit aggregation sales service, right? Mm-hmm. So this go to the website called greencredits.fourseason.com. Um, all the full registration is right there, mm-hmm. and uh, that's the easiest way to do that. Uh, okay. And, um, be pleased to help help anybody out. Right. And if they have any questions, is there a chat box or something like that that they can submit a question? Yeah, okay. Absolutely. There's so uh, emails, phone numbers, the, the entire thing there. Okay. Sure. Well, yeah. it all starts uh, in the beginning just with raising that awareness. So I, I really want to thank you for coming on the podcast and, and uh, helping us do that. Uh, I know we'll probably be having a lot of future conversations. Yeah. Um, again, we're sort of in this for the long haul as well, and it's not going to yeah. happen overnight. Yeah. So, uh, thanks, Ken, for the opportunity today. I really appreciate the you're conversation. Welcome. Thanks for dropping by. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please like and subscribe and check out the other episodes in this series. You can also find an audio version on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you download your podcasts. Thanks for watching.